All right, we've been on this series, you know, um, within the last um, couple of weeks um, that we titled um, the practice of discernment. The practice of discernment, and we have been looking at what discernment is for a while now, you know, um, looking at um, how does um, a person, a believer, come into the cement? At what point is the cement triggered in the believer? At what point does the believer receive the cement? All right, so um, while we'll do this together, all right, like we usually encourage, we will love for you to, you know, just flow um, and all right, you have your, your, your Bible, you have your pen, so that we can enjoy this ride together. All right, now, so we, we've been, you know, moving on progressively, all right, in relation to what the cement is. All right, so, um, so today we will continue from where we stopped. All right, we'll be continuing from where we stopped, you know, from the last um, session. All right, now, so um, so there are a couple of things we have looked at, you know, foundational in relation to what the sermon is, at what point is the sermon triggered in the believer. And don't forget that we call this series the practice of the sermon. In other words, um, there is a whole lot of responsibility on your own part, which in turn helps, you know, to facilitate the release of discernment you see which helps to cause discernment to be turned on to be turned on to be turned on in your heart to be turned on and become functional or operational in your life all right we talked about which we are going to you know go further into today we talked about um, discernment as a nature Discernment as an understanding, all right? Then discernment as a gift. And we said discernment on all these three levels, all right? They came triggered in a man, in a person, all right? The day he or she receives Jesus, the day he or she, you know, encounters the love of God, all right? The day he or she, uh, you know, uh, um, receives the revelation truth. You see, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, we explained we've explained this, you know, within the last um, two three weeks now. All right, so um, so that experience of the love of God, that experience of the life of God, you know, at the point of a person's new birth. All right, we said is the basis for the triggering is the basis for the triggering of discernment you see and we said that um the first you know exercise of discernment in a believer's heart was at the same time that discernment was triggered in a believer's heart all right the same time in which discernment became triggered in your heart was actually the same time that discernment was first exercised, all right? And we said that the exercise of discernment, all right, was in view of the person of the Lord. You see, it was by discernment that you were able to see the Lord at your new birth, you see? And we said that it was, it was this sight that your heart gained, this vision, this revelation of the person of the Lord that your heart gained that led to your conversion, that led to your new birth. You see, and we look at a couple of scriptures which we have looked at you know, in the last um, you know, um, session, the last, uh, yeah, the last session. All right, now, so in the very last session, we began to talk about how do you now as a believer begin to take responsibility for the release of discernment that is in your heart how do you as a believer begin to take responsibility for the operation of discernment 
You see, at your new birth, at your new birth, the spirit of God, all right, was solely responsible for the triggering of the cement in your heart. And he did that by the preaching of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which, you know, uh, we looked at in chapter four of second Corinthians, where Paul, the apostle speaking by the spirit of God, all right, describes the gospel of Jesus Christ as the knowledge of the glory of God that is in the face of Jesus. So through the revelation, all right, of the glory of God in the person of Jesus, that the spirit of God caused to shine in your heart, the sentiment became triggered. The sentiment became triggered. The sentiment became released in your heart. So how the sentiment becomes triggered in your heart or impacted in your heart, whatever word you choose to use, all right, at your new birth is, the, is solely the responsibility of God. Is solely the responsibility of the Holy Spirit, all right? That is actually what Apostle Paul in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians refers to, you know, when he said that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You see, no one can see Jesus except by the Holy Spirit. No one can say, to say there is to come into the acknowledgement of the Lordship of Jesus. And that cannot happen without the illumination that comes, you know, from the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the Spirit of God causes to shine into a man's heart, into a person's heart. You see, chapter 1 of the book of First Corinthians says that the preaching of the cross, you see, the preaching of the cross, which is another way of, you know, referring to the gospel of Jesus Christ, all right, which chapter 1 of Romans says is the power of God unto salvation, all right? So in chapter 1 of First Corinthians, it says that the preaching of the cross, it says to the Jews, is an offense unto the Greek. It's what? It's foolishness. It's about to us that are saved or that, that are being saved. It is the power of God. On, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God unto salvation. So the Holy Spirit is the one that causes the illumination of God, that causes the knowledge of the glory of God, all right, that is the manifestation of the person of Jesus to shine in the heart. So the first glimpse, the first vision that your heart gained of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, you see, was caused by the Spirit of God. And that first vision that your heart gained, all right, is how discernment, all right, became triggered in your heart. And the oppression of discernment in your heart at that point of your new birth was what led to your vision was what led to your heart's, you know, perception. That was what led to your heart's sight of the glory of God. So it was this vision of the glory of God. It was this revelation of the glory of God in the person of Jesus that your heart gained, that empowered your mouth to declare his lordship. So you see, the confession of the mouth, as described in chapter 10 of the book of Romans, in relation to new birth, the confession of your mouth, all right, occurred after your heart had first gained that vision. That is what Paul in chapter 10 of Romans describes as believing with the heart unto what, and confessing with the mouth unto what? Righteousness, salvation. You see, so the believing with the heart takes place first before the confession with the mouth in relation to new birth. So that vision of the Lord that you had gained, all right, is what empowered your mouth to declare. Because you see, that which your mouth declared, the Lordship of Jesus that your mouth, you know, acknowledged, all right, is a reflection of the revelation that your heart had come into. 
Now, so what I'm trying to show us here is the fact that, you know, the first and initial triggering of the sentiment in your heart at new birth was solely the responsibility of God. It was solely the responsibility of God. But you see, after a person is saved, after a person all right, has received the life of God, the release, the operation of discernment, you see, becomes your responsibility. The operation of discernment becomes your responsibility. Yes, someone is asking. Yes, we are on mix. We are on our mixed LR channel. If you go check it, Engaging God, all right, on our mixed LR channel, you will see it. It's currently on. It's currently on. If you prefer to connect via the mixed LR channel, so you can go ahead and check it again. It's on. All right. Okay, it's currently on. You can check it. Now, so it's important to understand this. It's important. Now, so in the last session, we began to talk about, you know, the things to begin to do, you know, by way of taking responsibility, by way of taking responsibility for the operation of discernment in our heart. We looked at that, you know, but we're going to, you know, touch a little bit on that. So please just uh, pay very close attention because this is so important. This is so important. It's so important to, you know, uh, uh, um, to your, your, your work in the kingdom. It's so important to your work with the Father. You see, how much you are able to grow, how much you are able to mature, you see, is... Um, to a large extent, dependent on you. You see, growth in the kingdom, you know, or maturity, you know, in God, or development in God, whichever one you prefer, in the kingdom, in God, all right, is, um, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, depends on you. You see, all that is required, all that is required to see to your development, all that is required, to see to your maturity, all right, are available. But you see how the believer, on the other hand, you know, begins to apply himself, begins to, you know, respond or begins to engage <clears throat> these, you know, divine processes put in place to, you know, accelerate our growth, all right, depends you know, so much on the believer, all right? In the kingdom, growth, maturity in the kingdom, you know, development in the kingdom, you know, um, stature gained, all right, does not happen by accident. And it doesn't happen by how long you've been around, you see? It doesn't happen by, you know, it doesn't happen on account of how long you've been saved. It doesn't happen on account of... Um, you know, you know, many of the things that we consider are the basis for growth. You see, mostly, you know, growth, growth, development, maturity, or, or the getting of stature, all right, depends on your taking responsibility, depends on, you know, applying of yourself, applying of your heart to the divine processes, you know, of you know growth that have been installed or that are in place in the kingdom for your own benefit. So in relation to discernment, all right, it's important to understand that after you had discernment, after you had discernment triggered or released in your in you in your heart, it's important to understand that from that time going forward the operations of discernment, all right, depends on your 
taking responsibility on you taking responsibility to ensuring that growth happens on you taking responsibility in ensuring that you know progression takes place you see progression doesn't just happen progression doesn't just happen it's no accident in any way so this is what we've been looking at for for some time now this is what we've been looking at for some time now so in relation to descendant <laughs> and how that applies to you and i taking responsibility all right in the last session we began to talk about the importance of um, you know intentionally exposing the heart to the truth of redemption all right now we explain what redemption means now we use the word redemption you know as a, a word that encapsulates you know the truth you know of our identification our union with god our identification with jesus christ the truth of our identity the truth of um, you know our new birth you know and all of that so taking the time after your new birth to begin to you know apply yourself to begin to expose your heart to the revelation of the truth of god's word consigning you know your new birth consigning salvation you see we said is the first you know um you know condition that must be met in order to begin to see discernment you know operate in our lives this is very important applying ourselves applying our hearts you know by having our hearts become exposed you know by inundating ourselves you see with the revelation truth of god's word you know in relation to our union in relation to our identification with christ in christ all right is the foundation all right to you know ensuring that discernment becomes operational you see and we explained in the last session that you cannot avoid that you cannot avoid that you cannot avoid that because you see in the foundational revelation of our redemption the heart all right is constantly inundated with the ever expanding vision or revelation of the lord don't forget we had explained that discernment is first and foremost about discernment as a matter of fact first means sight first it does not mean distinguishing between two you know two different things two different reality you know no that is not what it is to begin with to begin with discernment all right is about seeing is about seeing the lord and you see learning this is important because you see after your new birth all right training your heart to see the lord training your heart to see the lord you see notice i'm saying training your heart meaning you know it's it has a whole lot to do with you all right and of course you know of course it has a whole lot to do with um the environment that you find yourself you see after your new bed experience now by environment you know I, i'm talking about them um, you know, of course there are factors that's that 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 informs environment for example the the, the gathering of saints that you find yourself in after your new bed experience you see 
what their emphasis is or what their emphasis are. You see, the nature and character of the revelation truth that is emphasized. You see, these are factors that inform or that characterize the environment, which in turn, you know, determine how quick, you know, you will grow. You know, there have been times, you know, in different meetings when, you know, I would share around this and people would say, oh, wow, how come I didn't know this when I thought God said? Usually I tell people, now you are hearing this. Now you are listening to this. So you do not have an excuse. You can't, you shouldn't say, oh, I wish I had known this. Now, the last 10 years is gone. But the good news is that the last 10 years can be redeemed. The last five years is gone. So you don't say, oh, if I had known this five years ago, I would have grown, I would have been. Now, you are hearing this now. You are hearing this now. So it does mean that you can't take responsibility. You know, you can't take responsibility. So you don't go about saying, oh, if they had taught me this, you know, that blame game, if I had been taught this, if I had learned this, you know, but now you are hearing this. So it doesn't matter what the foundation was for you. You see, because when you look at the whole, you know, processes that is required, required, you know, to facilitate growth, all right, you would see that you have a certain, or you share in a certain degree of responsibility that is required for you to grow appropriately. So in relation to the sermon and how it affects, you know, your, how it affects your growth, you would see that it is first and foremost about seeing the Lord. Now, that is the reason why as soon as a person is saved, you see, as soon as a person is saved, how he is taught is very important. How he is taught is very important. And that's the reason why when you look at, you know, the revelation truth of the believer's redemption, you see, it focuses on the Lord. In all ramification, it focuses on the Lord. When you look at what the scripture says or teaches about, you know, the truth of our new birth experience, the truth of our, of our identity with Christ, you see, in his death, you see, in his, in his justification, in his resurrection, in his ascension, when you begin to look at the truth of God's word regarding your authority, regarding your current position, you will see that as all of those truths come together, all right, it emphasizes the Lord. All that you see is the Lord. All that you see is the Lord. Now listen very carefully. It is in seeing the Lord like this. All right? It is in seeing the Lord within the, you know, context, within the parameters of the revelation of truth. All right? In relation to our salvation or our redemption that you begin to see Satan. Listen carefully. It is within the context of the vision of the Lord that your heart is constantly gaining, coming into, all right, in relation to salvation, in relation to our identity, in relation to our union, in relation to forgiveness, in relation to our becoming the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that we begin to see Satan. Now, it is within the parameters of this vision that we begin to see Satan, all right, in his defeat. We begin to see Satan to the extent to which he, he has become defeated or he has been defeated. We begin to see sin, all right, in how it has been conquered. We begin to see the flesh, 
in how it has been crucified, we begin to see the world in how that as believers we have overcome it. You see, the heart begins to gain this vision and understanding. You see, as the heart is taught or trained to see the Lord, it is in the visions of the Lord that is communicated to us as truth that we see Satan in his defeat. We see sin, all right, in its defeat. We see flesh in that it is crucified. We see the world in that what we have triumphed over it. You see, this is the nature. This is the character, you see, of the discipline, you know, pattern as it were, of the early church. Hence, the reason why they found it very easy because a lot of times, you know, believers ask that question. You see, what was the secret of the early church? That is all we are looking at. Because a lot of times believers ask, how come the early church had so much power? That with ease, with ease, with ease, even the least of saints, the least amongst them, worked so much miracles. For example, you look at the book of Acts. The scripture tells us, of certain saints whose names are not mentioned in the book of Acts, all right, who were the first to take the gospel to the nations. You see, their names weren't mentioned. But you will see that every one of the saints found it very easy to walk in the supernatural, found it very easy to demonstrate the power and authority in the name of Jesus demonstrating the authority of Jesus over sickness and disease was normal. Was normal. So much so that many believers have wondered at what their secrets were. Many believers have wondered. You see, because in the setting of the heart on the truth of the revelation of the Lord. In the focusing of the heart of the, on the revelation of the Lord. The heart also, without that being the initial intent, the heart also sees the defeat of Satan. The heart sees, you see, the defeat of sin. The heart sees the powerlessness of the flesh. The heart sees the trampling under of the world. For example, the scripture tells in the book of 1 John, it's a fear not lead to children. For you have overcome them. You see, how does the heart come into that understanding? You see, it is by remaining transfixed on the vision of the Lord. It is by constantly exposing the heart to the vision of the Lord. All right? Within the context of the revelation truth consigning redemption. Now, I'd love to read a scripture again. We read this from the very beginning of this, you know, series, you know, from the very beginning of this series, chapter 26, all right, of the book of Acts. Chapter 26 of the book of Acts. We read that, we've read that a number of times amongst other scriptures. 26 again, in 26 of Acts, now here we see Paul, you know, um, bringing forth witness before Festus and Agrippa. All right. Now here, he began describing, all right, 
the things that the Lord said to him, all right, in his personal encounter with the Lord on the way to Damascus, on his way to Damascus to arrest, you know, and imprison the saints. Now, um, the Lord speaking to him, he says here, um, from verse 15, he says, and I said, who art thou, Lord? Now, Paul speaking. Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Verse 16, he said, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things. Notes. Notice that. He says, I have appeared unto thee. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in thee which I will appear unto thee. Now, this was an incident in which Paul, you know, while riding, you know, with other men that were in his team, part of his company, into Damascus to go and, you know, with, with, with permission from the priest, the Sahindri, you know, to go and arrest, you know, believers in Jesus Christ in Damascus and imprison them. You see, while on his way to the place, the Bible says that the Lord, the Lord appeared unto him. But you see, the scripture says that every other person that were in his team just saw a bright light. He said, but this bright light struck Paul, hit Paul to the ground. You see, so in that experience, now it is this experience that Paul is describing here and the words that the Lord Jesus spoke to him. All right. Now in describing one of the things that the Lord said to him, he says, the Lord said to him, for this reason, I have appeared unto thee. Now the word appear means to unveil. It means to be revealed. All right. To cause to be to, to, to see. All right. To pull back the veil. So you see, it says, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of these things which you have seen. Note, and it says, and of those things in thee which I will appear unto thee. Now, now listen. Now, if, if, you don't, if you're not very careful, you would tend to think that Paul, after this incident, on account of what Jesus said, he continued to have, you know, um, you know, Jesus appeared to him like this. Yes, the Jesus appeared to him on this very day. He did. All right. He saw the blinding light, <laughs> you see, of the person of Jesus. You see, he saw the light of the person of Jesus. Now, but you see, the light of the person of Jesus that struck Paul wasn't just a bright light. You see, that light, all right, is the unveiling of the revelation of God that is embodied in the person of Jesus. You see, and by reason of Paul's encounter, all right, with that light, all right, certain understandings, all right, entered into his heart. You see, that is what Paul is summarizing here when he says that the Lord said to him, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things, plural, these things. Now, if you read the story literally in the book of Acts, chapter 8, all right, it doesn't give you detail of what was said. The only detail you are given is that the Lord said to him, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Lord, who are, who are you? And he said, for I'm Jesus Christ, whom thou persecutest. You see, and the Lord went ahead and quoted a proverb to him. All right? And Paul, you know, was there, broken, powerless, blinded. In detail, not much is said that Paul had. But so much transpired. That is why Paul here, in quoting the words of Jesus to him, said Jesus, he said Jesus said to him, for this reason, I have appeared unto thee to make you a minister and a witness of those things, or these things, plural. These things, these things. What are the things that Paul was to be a minister and a witness of? It's not, Paul didn't go everywhere telling everybody, you know, 20 years ago, Jesus appeared to me. 15 years ago, on the 15th of February, Jesus appeared to me. No. 
Rather, the things that became unveiled to his heart, you see, that captures the appearance of Jesus were the revelation truth. You see, that Paul became a minister and a witness of. You see, because that scripture also says, not only of this, it's about also of those things indeed which I will appear. You see, I said that the word appeared there means to unveil, to cause to be revealed, to cause to be seen. So Jesus spoke to Paul here about what? Those things in the future in which I will, I will appear unto thee. That means I will cause to be unveiled. See, the appearance here is not just the appearance of Jesus in shape and form, but it is the appearance of Jesus in a way that causes what? Veils to be removed. In a way that causes insight, revelation, understanding to come about. You see, that is what actually happens every time. You see, the revelation of truth of God comes forth. Every time the revelation of truth of God comes forth, that is an appearing of the Lord Jesus. People think the appearing of the Lord Jesus is when they see shape and form. It's when they see Jesus walk into their room, which is good. But you see... <laughs> The walking of Jesus into your room can never be greater than the unveiling of truth in scriptures. Do you understand that? You see, that, that's the reason why in, in, in my years of in the walk with the Lord, I've read a number of many persons' experiences. Oh, I saw Jesus. He said this. He said this. And I've looked at many of the things that people say Jesus said to them in their parents. And I was just like, oh, man. Oh, good. It's good. But you see, if this person, all right, had looked at the scripture more closely, you see, what he said Jesus said to him, he could have seen in the scriptures. He could have seen in the scriptures. He could have seen in the scriptures. You see, that is why he gave us the spirit of truth. In chapter 16 of John, he said, how be it? You see, when the spirit of truth is come, you see, he says he will do what? He will guide you into all. <laughs> do you understand that? Into all. Into all. That means there is, there is nothing about the Lord Jesus that the spirit of truth is not committed to bringing you into. There is nothing. There is nothing. And there is nothing the physical, tangible manifestation of Jesus can reveal to you that the spirit of truth is not committed to bringing you into. Hello. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Reading that scripture for that chapter 16 of John, he says, for all that the Father hath and mine, therefore say I unto you that he shall take of what is mine and reveal it to you. And reveal it to you. So you see, the continuous unveiling that the heart is exposed to, all right, is what the scripture refers to here as the appearing of Jesus, as the appearing of the Lord. Now, the word appearing there, we've looked at that, you know, I think some two weeks ago, that that word means to uncover. It means to unveil. So you see, it means to unveil. So Jesus, yes, speaking to Paul, says, I've made you a minister and a witness, both of these things which you have seen, and of those things in thee which I will appear unto thee. I will uncover unto you. I will unveil. So it is not an appearance of shape and form, but an unveiling, an uncovering of truth. An uncovering of truth. And you see, what Paul said here, what, it's not only applicable to Paul, all right? It is actually applicable to all of God's children. 
You see, there is that initial unveiling of Christ. You see, that caused the veil of the God of Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three. All right, into into verse four. There is that unveiling of Christ of truth that caused the veil of the God of Jesus to be removed from your heart. All right, and that caused the glory, the knowledge of the glory of God, which Jesus is the manifestation of, to shine in your heart. That was your first experience of the appearing of the Lord. The uncovering, the unveiling of the Lord. And from that moment going forward, all right, the Lord is committed just as he gave voice to his commitment to Paul in this experience of Paul. You see, the Lord is committed, all right, to ensuring the continuous constant, endless appearing. See the word appearing again? To unveil, to uncover. But you see, as a believer, you have a responsibility in committing your heart to this unveiling. You see, this is your first responsibility. Listen carefully. This is your first responsibility in ensuring that your heart masters the practice of discernment. Don't forget we said discernment, all right, at the foundation is gaining sight of the Lord. It's in view of the Lord. It is seeing the Lord. So you see, this informs, this shows you your responsibility in seeing to it, in seeing to it, that your heart learns, your heart, all right, masters the practice of discernment. You see, mastering the practice of discernment begins with committing your heart to remaining transfixed on the revelation of the Lord, all right, within the parameters, first within the parameters of the truth of your redemption of the truth of the salvation that you have experienced. And I said earlier that it is within the context of the truth of your redemption, the truth of your new birth, all right, that you also gain sight. That is when you learn. You learn. That is where your heart also perfects. You see, the discernment, all right, the discernment of Satan in his defeat, the discernment of sin, in its defeat, the discernment of the flesh in its crucifixion, the discernment of this world in its defeat as well. It is in your vision of the Lord that you see that in that vision, you in him, you have triumphed over Satan, you have triumphed over sin, you have become crucified to the flesh, and you have overcome the world. See, listen. This listen carefully. This foundation, you see, is what enables your heart to discern Satan. You see, this foundation is what gives birth to the ease with which, as a believer, you are able to exercise your authority over Satan. With which, as a believer, you are able to exercise your liberation. All right. Oh, from sin, you're able to exercise your 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 the truth, all right, of your crucifixion to, to the flesh, and you're able to exercise the truth of your triumph over the world. You see, it is when believers, it is when the heart of the believer has not mastered this that you now begin to see believers who are struggling with Satan. You now begin to see a believer. All right, that Satan is making a mess of in one area or the other. You now begin to see a believer who is still having issues and struggles, all right, where sins are concerned or sin is concerned. You know, you now begin to see a believer, you know, that's on account of sin consciousness. You now begin to see a believer who is struggling with the flesh, who is praying to God, oh God, deal with my flesh. <laughs> but the scripture says that you are crucified. You are crucified. To the flesh. You are dead to it. You are dead to it. 
So someone asks, if I'm dead to it, all right, why, why do I still feel the motions of sin? You see, you still do because the truth, the truth of your triumph over it has not gained entrance into your heart yet. Now, that is the reason why when you look at what the scripture teaches about the believer's triumph over Satan, over sin, you see, over, over, over uh, you know, the flesh, over the world, over sickness and disease, you know that the context in which the scripture talks about them is in the past tense. It's in the past tense. The scripture says, you have overcome the world. It didn't say you will overcome the world. It says you have overcome the world. The scripture says that you are crucified to the world. You are crucified to the flesh. The scripture says what? That you have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The scripture talks about what? The, your, your triumph. You see, over Satan. It says, blessed be God who leads us in continuous triumph. <laughs> in continuous triumph. Second Corinthians, chapter one. In continuous triumph. Continuous triumph. So you see, it is in remaining transfixed on the vision of the Lord. It is in disciplining the heart to master the practice of discernment. Now, discernment now, which speaks of seeing the Lord first. Discernment is not about seeing Satan first. It's not about seeing demons first. You see, discernment is not about, you know, detecting, you know, you know, distinguishing the operations of darkness first. You see, putting darkness and its power where it belongs all right, is on the foundation of the revelation understanding that the heart has gained of the vision of the Lord first. You see, it's important that you understand this. You see, believers, you see, who have trained your heart by fellowship, all right, to Focus on the visions of the Lord, on the account of which they see him in his triumph, they see him in his conquest, they see him in his victory, they see him in his ascension, and they see themselves in his conquest, they see themselves identified with him, you see, in his resurrection, they see themselves identified with him in his justification, they see themselves identified with him in his ascension. Those believers are usually The ones who have, to a greater extent, you know, a great effectiveness, you see, in exercising authority over the works of the devil. Over the works of the devil. That is the number one secret of the early church. You see, that practice, the scripture tells us, in the book of Acts, that the apostles taught daily in the temple. They taught daily in the temple. All right? And breaking bread from house to house. They taught daily. What were they teaching? They were teaching Christ. <laughs> you see, Christ crucified. Christ Justified, Christ resurrected, Christ ascended. And it was in teaching death that the believers saw themselves in Christ crucified, saw themselves in Christ justified, saw themselves in Christ resurrected, saw themselves in Christ ascended. And that in turn produced the ease with which they were able to cast out devils, with which they were able to heal the sick, with which they were able to exercise authority, all right, over the powers of nature. You see, in regards to 
exercising authority over the works of Satan, in regards to exercising authority, all right, over the works of the devil, you know, sickness and disease, all right, it was not something they pressed into. You see, they didn't press into healing. They didn't pay the price for God's power. <laughs> no! Rather, they were shown the price. They were shown the price that was paid. Their heart gained visions of the price that was paid. The more their heart became inundated with the truth of the price that was paid, the easier they found it to exercise authority, to walk in the truth of the price that was paid. You see, to see healings, wrath, in the matchless name of Jesus, the easier they were able to exercise authority over the over 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 sicknesses and disease, over Satan, over demons of witchcraft. You see, you see how the scripture tells us of, of Philip, who went to one of the cities of Samaria and single-handedly, no ministry team followed him. Do you understand that? <laughs> no ministry team, no publicity for the meeting months ahead. He just went there. You see, he went there and revival broke out. No preparation for revival. <laughs> Do you understand that? Just went there. You see, an evangelism began to happen. So said, oppression broke. You see, the sorcery power that the man called Simon had exercised over them was broken. Broken. Single-handedly by one man. By one person. By one person. By one person. By one person. I love to read to you. I, you know, I love how the King James reads that, you know, uh, 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 you know, reads in that very, uh, read that very verse. Glory to Jesus forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, chapter 8. Chapter 8, it says, um, that's Acts chapter 8. Verse 5, it says, then Philip, Philip, just one man. <laughs> Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things. Unto those things which Philip spake. He hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. You see, Miracles became easier as he preached Christ. The Christ, you see, the Christ, you see, the vision that his heart has gained understanding of. That was what he preached. You see, and as a result, healings and miracles were all. The seven says, for unclean spirits, for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with diseases, or palsies rather, and that were lame and were healed. And there was great joy in that city. All right? Then verse 9 began to tell you of, what, of how the power of Simon the sorcerer was broken over that city. You see, walking in the miraculous was normal in the early church. Because you see, it says that the apostles remained committed to the unveiling of Christ. You see, the unveiling. You see, but the people too you know, sharing the responsibility, you see, of exposing their heart. It meant that they were present in those meetings. It meant that when they went back home, they continued to look into distance. They continued in meditation, in contemplation, to remain transfixed upon distance. To remain what? Fixated in their heart upon distance. They continued to, to, to remain glued to, upon distance. You see, these Cost their heart to reach out. You see, in simple belief. In simple belief. See, many of the things, you know, that some people call dimensions of miracles, dimensions of healing, that we have categorized, that many people in this generation are pressing into, was normal. It was easy. It was easy. Seeing the deaf speak, the deaf hear, rather, 
was easy. Seeing the dumb speak was easy. You see, seeing paralyzed limbs receive strength was easy. Seeing the blind see was easy. Seeing cancers dematerialize was easy. Not just for the apostles, but for every saint. Every saint. Every saint. They didn't need to study about the devil. They didn't need to study about the hierarchy of demonic powers. <laughs> to exercise authority over demonic powers. As long as they remain transfixed and fixated on the vision of the Lord. In the vision of the Lord, they saw the fall. They saw the defeat of Satan. It doesn't matter whether it was new age power or cultic power. It doesn't matter their categorization. All of them, all of them, all of them were defeated. Defeated in Christ. The vision of all of their defeats. So the believer does not need to prepare specially because this one is occultic power. The believer does not need to prepare specially because this one is what is marine power. The believer does not need to prepare specially because this one is what? You know those categorizations? So this one is... <laughs> say, no, this one is Asmodi spirit. <laughs> I don't care what your names are. You have authority over them. Over them. Over them. Over them. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory, glory, glory to Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory. Glory. <laughs> you know, I told a story recently, you know, of a certain beloved, you know, dear woman who told me about, you know, uh, her, her dad, who was, you know, had been in the occult and all of that. And she wanted me to come and preach to him. He was very much in the occult and all of that. I didn't need to prepare. I didn't need to fast. You see, in fact, the day I went there, I just stopped by. I was in a hurry. I was going somewhere. <laughs> I didn't need to prepare. You know, he, he, was, he was an awkward grandmaster. So I need to maybe do a two, three days fast. No, listen carefully. <laughs> it doesn't matter what he was because he's free now. So I can speak of it in the past. It doesn't matter what level he got to. You see, in the vision of Christ that my heart has remained trans, transfixed upon, I saw the defeat of Satan and all the other cadres of demonic hierarchies under him. All together. Whether it is occultism, witchcraft, whatever it is. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. No special preparation. The only preparation, brothers and sisters, that you need is the preparation of transfixing your heart on the vision of the Lord. It's in the pre That is preparation, actually. When your heart remains focused, when your heart remains focused, you see, when your heart is constantly inundated with the vision of the Lord, Jesus said to Paul there, he said, I've, say, for this purpose, did I appear to you to make you a minister and a witness of those things? He said, and of also of those things in which I will appear, appear that means to unveil, to uncover, to uncover, to uncover. We read the scripture, chapter five, 1 of Ephesians. All right, in, in the last session, all right, Ephesians 1, where Paul says that I pray for you. Since they are ahead of your faith and your love towards us, says, this is not to make mention of you, my prayers. Asking that the, the God of glory, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, will give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. We spoke about knowledge of God, the epignosis of God. That as a result, the eyes of your heart will become flooded with light. That you now begin to come to know what is the hope of his calling. You see? Nothing about the devil was mentioned there. That you come to know what is the hope of his calling. What is the riches of, of his inheritance in the saints. What is the exceeding greatness of his power. You see, that is, our, that is, our, that is at our disposal. Say the exceeding greatness of his power that is at our disposal. All right? His mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand, far above principalities and powers, thrones, dominions, and every name that's tied to, every name that can be named, every name that can be named. You see, 
It is in remaining transfixed on the vision of the Lord that produces the ease, the ease with which you exercise authority. The ease with which you exercise authority over Satan. The ease with which you walk in victory over sin. The ease with which you walk in victory. You see, over the world comes from the discernment of the heart or the discernment of the Lord that the heart constantly remains transfixed. The discernment. The discernment. So just in case, just in case you're listening to me and there's an area of life, there's an area of life where you probably are having struggles in putting Satan in his place. Maybe there's an area in your life where there's a constant bombardment of Satan. You see, maybe for the time being, stop the prayer. <laughs> for the time being, stop the prayer. You've been praying. You say you've been confessing. You say you've been declaring. Maybe for the time being, just relax. Just relax. You see, and indulge your heart. Indulge your heart in the vision of the Lord. Once again, tantalize your heart. You see, set before your heart for the next couple of days and weeks. Set before your heart the vision. The, you see, one of the mistakes we make as believers, you see, after we become saved, you know, you know because of the culture, because of the, 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 the practice in, 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 you know, in, um, in most of our assemblies, most of our, you know, church gathering, you know what I, by that I mean, the gathering of saints, you know, as soon as somebody is saved, you know, and, um, and um, you know, sometimes because of how quick, you know, ministers of the gospel, how quick, you know, ministers of the gospel want to grow their, 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 their the church body. You see, they are quick to put new believers into positions of um, responsibility or leadership. You see, we are quick to do that because we want, you see, you know this thing about the church needs to come out of this thing. You know, where we, we want to appear beautiful to the world. You know, we, 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 we want this standard. You know, we want to, we want to measure. We want, we, want, we, we want to have order. Nothing is wrong with having order in our gatherings. But it should never be at the expense, you see, of the growth of the saints. Should never be at the expense of the growth of the saints. Should never, you see, should never it's, it's good, you know, it's good, for example, when we come into our meetings, they have greeters, nothing is wrong with that, I don't have a problem with that. But you see, someone who still needs to sit down and participate in the, in the teaching from the beginning of the meeting should not be made to stand outside. <laughs> Am I really going into this again? <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. You see, you see, <laughs> you know, um, 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 there, are, there are a couple of things, you know, I learned from scriptures. I learned, for example, from the Lord. When you look at the Gospels, for example, you look at the Gospels, for example, you will see that in many of Jesus' meetings, everybody would sit down, including, including the disciples, sit down. Nobody was ushering anything, you know. You know that everybody will sit down and listen. So much so that the scripture tells us that on one of the occasions, when the multitude had gathered around you and are still just for three days, the Bible says that Jesus began to send them away and he told his disciples to go ahead of him to get into the, the only available boat and you know. Go to the other side and wait. Just they should go ahead of him. And the scripture said that Jesus waited behind to single handedly send away the multitude. Waited behind. Waited behind. 
to single-handedly send away the multitude. He waited behind. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, in our in 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 church communities, you know, around the world, somebody gets saved last week, all right? And because he has a good singing voice, the next thing is we look for what? We just put him in the, in the singing department. Now, what will he sing? Failing to realize that singing, singing in the church, in the ecclesia of Jesus, it is not first and foremost a primary function of a good voice. It is first and foremost the primary function of what? Of accurate understanding. That's the reason why you look, at, look around us, look around the world. You see many Christian musicians that have good voice. But when you look at the content of what is being sung, there is no truth in it. But of course, we know that there are lots of beautiful voices, you know, individuals who have blessed us. But there are still many more. Who because, you know, because that's the practice. He opens his mouth. She opens his mouth. She's singing. What are you going to sing? <laughs> what are you going to say? What are you going to say? Oh dear Jesus. You see, singing, the art of singing in the church of Jesus Christ is not first and foremost on the basis of having a good voice. It is first and foremost on the foundation of truth. What we sing must be truth. You see, so for a new believer, what he sings must be a reflection of his understanding, his understanding of redemption. So when he sings, he must sing redemption. When he sings, he must sing salvation. But you see, he can't sing that if he hasn't been taught it. He can't sing that if his heart has not gained understanding of it. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory, glory to God. Glory. Glory. See, when you look at the early church, same thing. Same thing. The apostles taught daily. The apostles taught daily. That's why when you, when you read the epistles, you see, you hardly, listen carefully, now please don't get me wrong, you hardly hear anything mentioned about a singing department. You see, in fact, it was much later the apostles thought it necessary to ordain deacons to help with the responsibility of administration, you see, where the feeding of widows is concerned. Because everyone would just come and sit down and just hear and sit down and be taught. That is the number one ingredient, all right, that made the manifestation of the supernatural, you see, the practice, you see, of every one of the saints, every one of them, demonstrated the supernatural power of God. And that is came from the understanding gained as they were taught. That ease came from the understanding gain as their hearts were constantly exposed to the truth and vision of the Lord. You see? You see? Now that's why if you go further, you begin to see what Apostle Paul spoke about in relation to singing. First, they made sure that everyone learned how to sing from the truth of redemption. Chapter 5 of Ephesians, that's what he tells you. He was talking to the whole church. He wasn't talking to the singing department of the church. Ephesians 5, 18. He said, be not drunk with wine. He was speaking to the whole church. Not to the singing department or the singing group or the singing team. Be not drunk with wine. King James now, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Speaking to yourselves, plural. Sing, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns singing spiritual songs and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. 
You see, he says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. Now, of course, we know the psalms and hymns they spoke, you see, was a reflection, was an expression of the revelation, understanding their heart had gained, <laughs> you see, of redemption. Which in turn, under the influence of the Spirit, will gain expression through your heart as beautiful melodies. You see, as beautiful poetic expressions. That's what I meant by psalms and hymns. Then it says singing spiritual songs. Then making melody. So maybe, as I was saying, please, I need to quickly say this before we move on. Maybe you're here. There's an area where you, you are con you've been constantly bombarded by the, the adversary. Now you see, do not fall into that pit where you begin to say, no, it's God's dealing with you. No. We dealt with this some weeks back. Constantly being bombarded by the adversary. Or constantly being bombarded by certain expressions of the flesh. Maybe certain addiction to sin. A secret sin that you are held in bondage to, and you've been praying, you've been fasting, but it's not going. No heads way. Stop the praying. You have been praying. Stop the praying. Stop the confession. You've been confessing. Stop the fasting. What do you do? Go into another kind of fast. This is not an abstinence from food. You see, this is a focusing of your heart on the truth of redemption. A focusing on, 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 of the heart on the truth of God's of consigning your eternal and eternalless union with Christ. Focus your heart on the truth of God's of consigning your identification with Christ. Your identification. Focus on the truth of God's word regarding your exalted, seated position in Christ. Just go and just go and sit down with God's word surrounding this. Just sit. Stop praying about the challenge. Stop praying about the situation. Just leave all of that alone. Leave all of that. Just leave all of that. And just get lost in the art of meditation on the truth of the vision of the Lord. Like I said earlier, it's in that vision you see your oneness with him in his triumph over Satan. You see your oneness, your identification with him in his triumph over sin. You see your identification, you see your union with him in his triumph over the world, over sickness and disease, over all of the powers of the enemy. Just go do this first. Go, go get drunk. Get, get intoxicated. And you will see, in fact, that by the time you get high, <laughs> there are some of those situations you will not even need to see anything. All you will need to do is just to look at them. And their power will just break off of you. Some others, all you will need to do is in a in a voice characterized, soaked in the peace, in the peace of God that transcends understanding, you would speak to it and its power will break. Break off of that area of your life. Break off. You see, what do you think informed what Peter and John said when they said to the lame man, silver and gold we do not have, but what we have we give to you. You see, they knew by revelation understanding that they have authority. They knew. See, this knowing wasn't just head-based. It was heart-based. You see, it takes the heart being drunk, drunk and intoxicated by that understanding to say, I have something. That's something I have I will give to you now. In the name of Jesus, get up! 
I love, I love how the scripture describes it. When Peter met the man called Enneas, all he did was, he said, Enneas. This was a man, you know, you know, lame from birth. He just said, Enneas, Jesus Christ makes you whole. Jesus Christ makes you whole. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, forever. 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 You know, I, I, I love I love I love what Paul said to Timothy, all right, in first Timothy chapter four. I love what Paul said to Timothy in first Timothy chapter four. You see, of course, we know, you know, here Paul had given Timothy a number of instructions, you know. All right, part of which emphasized the truth of salvation, the truth of the grace of God in Christ Jesus. All right, all right, and specific admonitions, you see, that he was to follow to make a full proof of his ministry, of his calling. But you see, when you look at verse, um, when you look at verse um, uh, chapter 4 now, chapter 4, from verse 13, it says, Still I come. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. All right? Doctrine there means to teaching. All right? The, the emphasis, the truth emphasis of the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right? The teaching of the truth emphasis of the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right? Give attention to it. It says give attendance to reading, exhortation, and to doctrine. You know? Both to the truth and the art of communicating it. See, so doctrine there is what is being taught the revelation truth and the art of communicating it. You see, that's the teaching and that which is being taught. You see, verse 14, it says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Verse 15 says, Meditate upon these things. You see, this is in chapter 4. So when he says these things, he's talking about all that he had begun to share with him from chapter 1. From, so it wasn't, now these things isn't just about the things shared in this chapter, all right? It encapsulates, it embodies all that Paul had begun to share from chapter one of the book of First Timothy, you see? Which I said a larger part of it, all right, includes the emphasis Paul was making repeatedly, all right, of the grace of God in Christ Jesus, about regarding redemption, regarding salvation, you see? So it says, meditate upon these things. It says, give thyself wholly. Wholly there is an old English word for completely, entirely. It says, give yourself entirely to these things. It says, that thy profiting, thy profiting, you see, thy profiting will appear to all. Thy profiting will appear to all. In fact, you know, a, a better translation, all right, one of the transition notes I've checked, when it says that, where it says that a prophet may appear to all, one translation I have says that thy profiting may appear in all. You see, now the word profiting also means progress. It says, so the progress that is made by meditating on these things, by remaining transfixed on these things, it says, will become evidenced in all areas. We become evidenced in all areas. You see? Now, King James says that thy prophecy may appear to all, which suggests people, people seeing your progress. You see? But the translation says that your progress will, may, will appear in all. You see? So it is not just in view of people, but it's in relation to what? Every area. Every area. 
Glory to Jesus. Every area. So you see, the, 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 the act, listen carefully. We are talking about discernment. The act or the practice of discernment, all right? Now we spoke about discernment in relation to what seeing the Lord. See, this is something that every believer must learn first. Every believer must learn first. Every believer must learn first. The practice of discernment in connection to transfixing the heart, all right, or focusing the heart on the Lord. Now listen carefully. When we say on the Lord, please, please, I beg you, don't just think of worship meeting, listen to a worship song. You know, when we sing, I see the Lord, I see. How do you see the Lord? It is not by closing your eyes and seeing form. <laughs> no, you see the Lord basically foundationally. You see the Lord within the context of the truth. The truth of his triumph. <laughs> you see, and the truth of what? Of your identification with him in his triumph over Satan. Your identification with him in his triumph over sin. Your identification with him in his triumph over the world. So when you say, I see the Lord, how are you seeing him? How? How? So when you sing a song, oh God, I want to see you. I want to see you. <laughs> Do you know he is looking at you? <laughs> Pick up the book, my friend. Pick it up and see him. Pick. See, every time you pick it up, the spirit comes along. He's the spirit of truth. He comes along to uncover. Don't forget what he said to Paul. He said, for this reason have I made you a minister and a witness of those things in which I have appeared to you. He said, and of those things indeed which I will yet appear to you. The, we said the word appear, that means to uncover. So when he said, Lord, we want to see you. We want to see you. We want to see you. You see, where he answers that prayer, you see, is in teaching meetings. Do you sit down <laughs> and see him? Where he answers that prayer is in your closet during your times of meditation. Do you understand that? That is where what? He causes veils to, further veils to fall off. Causes what? Enlarge understanding. To break out in your heart. That is what happens. That in turn leads to what? You stepping out, stepping out of your house every day on top of the world. You step out of your apartment every day. You see, with, with, with a triumph consciousness. You see, with a victory consciousness. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus forever. <laughs> forever. So you see, that's what we said. You see, that's what we call the practice. Because it is suggesting of responsibility on your part. On your part. You must sit down. You see, you must sit down. You must sit down. You must sit down to have your heart penetrated. Penetrated. You see? Penetrated with the light. Paul calls it the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. You see? Your experience with that knowledge, the knowledge of that glory, was not a one-time, and it's not a one-time experience. It is a continuous, ceaseless, constant experience. That is why I said to Paul that of those things indeed which I will yet appear to you. For he yet appears to you. He yet uncovers to you. He yet, he's constantly unveiling. Constantly causing your heart to see him. Constantly causing your heart to grasp the vision of him constantly strengthening your heart grip of the vision of him constantly constantly see listen folks 
This is the foundation of discernment. Say, so listen, if as a believer you do not understand this, such a believer will have issues in his work with God. It doesn't matter. It may be 10 years after, maybe 15 years, maybe 20 years after. Such a believer will have issues. We have issues. It will show. It will show. It will show in the extent to which we're able to exercise authority over life's issues. It will show in the extent to which you're able to, you are able to enforce your triumph, your triumph over sin. It will show in the, in, you know, to the degree to which you're able to exercise, you're able to enforce your liberation from the hold of the flesh. It will show. It will show. It will show. See, so listen, this is the foundation. The foundation is not of discernment is not about seeing angels. We'll talk about that, but this is the foundation. You don't jump class. You don't jump class of what use is seeing angels. And yet, very silly, stupid, low-class demons are mes mesmerizing you, making a mess of you. Making a mess of you. Of what use? Of what use? Is experiencing trances. Of what use? When devils are making, making, making a show. Of what use? Where you cannot from the place you see, of simple understanding, simple understanding of your union with Christ in his triumph, of simple understanding of your authority, all right, by virtue of your exalted seated position in Christ, you are able to exercise authority, all right, over destructive weather patterns, destructive weather patterns, Jesus said to the storm, peace, peace. It's the same thing. When he said, be still, it's the same thing. Peace. That means quiet him now. Quiet him. Shut up now. Shut up. Calm down now. <laughs> Calm down now. Calm down. And the scripture says that the disciples saw, saw the storm. You know, you know how you would, you know how you quiet in a wild dog. How you quiet in a wild dog? You know, some years back, you know, I was coming from um, a, an outreach meeting that I'd gone for. At, from an outreach meeting, you know, where we, you know, we saw people healed, saw people feel the Holy Ghost, and I was coming back, you know, and at the time, because of how late it was, I was having to go spend the night at my sister's place, you know, and this was already, you know, between the hours of 11 p.m. and 12 midnight. So there was no vehicle, so I was walking down. So while walking down this, this long road, you know, there was a particular house where they had security dogs. It was, I happened to be walking down the road at a time, at the time where they were feeding the dogs before they released them in the compound. So for some reason, the security guy had, you know, I think from, from by oversight, had left the gates open. So I was coming, you know, you know, with the excitement of the healings that, you know, we saw the excitement of the number of persons that got saved, you know, just coming and just, you know, whistling, you know, whistling. And... In the twinkling of an eye, <laughs> you know those moments. Those moments you call the twinkling of an eye. You know, <laughs> you know these dogs. These were security dogs, built heavily built. Oh! You see, came out of the gate, and before I could say, Jesus Christ <laughs> or Yeshua Hamashiach. <laughs> These dogs dashed towards me. And as I turned in a split second, you see, for weeks, I kept wondering how I was able to say that that quickly. See, what came out of my mouth was, say it in the name of Jesus. Very fast. I tell you, it was faster than this. See, and these dogs, now, 
the first three of them, all right, from where they had got into, had leapt into the air. They had jumped. They were mid air. You know, they were going to have a feast of this, <laughs> of this, <laughs> of this guy. You know, the first three had leapt in the air, and the remaining four of them, the remaining four of them were still coming. You know, coming at me. As I said, seat from mid air. This one that was mid air. It was as though an invincible force struck them in mid air. In mid air, the power of God hit the first three that were in mid air, and they hit the floor. Pam, 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 and the remaining four just came to a halt and sat down, and they began to squeal like like babies. And I said, "Get off!" And all seven of them ran into the gate, one after the other. Pam, 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 pam. One after the other. Now, I see, as soon as that was done, the security men, the guards that were on the street, on seeing that, quieting down, in shock, and of course, mixed with fear, and began to look at me. So I just kept going. And I, they didn't know I was hearing what they were saying. They were speaking in the Yoruba language. And they were saying, this guy, this is not, this is not human. Because number one, they looked at the time. And number two, they were trying to process how a total stranger. Now, this were trained security doors, but what? How a total stranger would have used the name of Jesus to strike three big dogs in mid air, strike them down, and to sit four big, muscular, <laughs> wild looking dogs, sit them, and to send them running again. You see, it just came out. He just came out. I didn't plan for that. I didn't prepare for that. But it just came out. You see, now, what I'm saying is this. You see, it is in that vision, in that, this breaks out of that vision of seeing the Lord. Because, listen, listen, in seeing the Lord, listen carefully, you would see yourself in your identification with him. All right? In your identification with him, in his triumph over Satan. You will see yourself in your identification with him, in his triumph over sin, sickness, and disease. You will see yourself in your, in your, in, in, in your identification with his triumph, his triumph over the flesh over the world, you will. So you see, listen carefully. <laughs> you will see the Lord, you will see yourself. And guess what? You will see the enemy, you will see Satan. You will see Satan defeated. You will see sin, you see, defeated. You will see sickness and disease vanquished. You will see the flesh, you see. You will see the world trampled upon, trampled upon. You see, so the practice of discernment, you see, in view of the Lord, all right, will teach your heart, will impact into your heart the revelation understanding, you see, of who you are in the Lord, the revelation understanding, you see, of Satan's current defeated, vanquished position. Listen, folks, this is the first discernment to gain mastery in. Hello. This is the first course when it comes to the subject of discernment. This is the first course. This is discernment 101 <laughs> or discernment, you know, zero, zero, one. <laughs> You know, however you want to put it. This is the foundation of discernment. 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 You see? This is the, this, the foundation. 
of the sinner. You see, this is the foundation. Oh, glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus forever. Glory to God forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. 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 So the same, like I said, is not about seeing angels first. We'll come to that, you see, in the, in the, in the future, you know, teaching sessions on the subject of the practice of this. We'll come to that, you see. The sermon is not first and foremost about seeing angels. It's not first and foremost about, you know, seeing descending demons. It's not first and foremost about, you know, telling, distinguishing between error and truth. You see, it is not first and foremost, you know, about those operations of the kingdom realms. This is the foundation. This is, this is what discernment is first and foremost about. This is what it is first and foremost about. This is what it is about to begin with. Because you see, when the heart does not have a grip of this, you see, an attempt to walk or exercise discernment, you see, within the context or at, of other kingdom operation, will be defective. There will be defectiveness in the exercise of discernment in other operations of the kingdom. Glory to Jesus. Glory to God forever. Forever. Glory, glory, glory to Jesus. Glory, glory to God. Glory to God forever. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Glory, glory. to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. So you see, you know, on this, on this, um, 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 in relation to the practice of discernment, all right, as it relates to the foundation, all right, as it relates to the foundation, all right, we are bringing that to a close, all right. So in the upcoming series, in the upcoming session, I meant to say, all right, in the upcoming session, would we'll take it a step further, all right, on the subject of the practice of discernment. We will take it a step further. But you see, it was necessary for us to lay this foundation. Necessary for us to lay this foundation. Necessary for us to lay this foundation. All right? So we, we implore you to revisit these sessions. Revisit them. You know, you know, we have it recorded on Facebook Live. All right? We have it um, recorded via Zoom. All right, and some persons are listening via MixLR. All right, on the MixLR, every time we have a session, we save each of the sessions. All right, so we want to implore you to go listen to the sessions again and again. You know, and as a matter of fact, you know, engage in some of the exercises that we mentioned earlier. For example, you know, within the last, you know, in the last few minutes, I spoke about you know going to indulge your heart. All right, intoxicating yourself. All right, with the truth of the foundations of your redemption in Christ. You see. Indulging your heart. Once again, you see, what if you're listening? All right, you may not have any particular challenge or you know or such, but you see, you can revisit the truth again. Look at it again. Look at it again. Look at it again. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Forever. And ever. All right, so we're not stretching this session beyond two hours, all right? We're not stretching beyond two hours. We started at about seven, all right? And this is already nine, all right? So um, that's what we're going to be doing, all right? We're saying minimum time spent is just two hours because, you know, we don't want to stretch people too much, all right? So we're going to be seeing you again, all right? Next week, Tuesday, same time, all right? It's an ongoing series. Next week, Tuesday, same time. And next week, Friday, same time, all right? On the subject of the practice of discernment. All right, so stay blessed. Grace to you, the grace, the grace of God. All right, be multiplied to you. 
be enlarged in you by the revelation of knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Grace to you. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And amen forever. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you so Thank much, you, Pastor. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very sir. much, sir. God bless you very much. Thank you so so much, sir. God bless you. Sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, so much. Thank you, Pastor. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, God. Love you. Thank you.